Joining us now from London is Helen Thomas. She's the CEO and founder of Blonde Money, a macroeconomic consulting firm. Also with us from Lancaster, England, is Garrett Johns. He's a professor of economics at Lancaster University. From Palace, Alexis Paulin is the co-founder of Le Monde Moderne and an analyst on European Union affairs. And here with us in the studio is Garrett Martin. He's a professional lecturer at the School of International Service at American University right here in Washington. Welcome to all of you to the show. Alexi, let me start with you. Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, is now finalizing details of this Brexit plan, and there is so much uncertainty over it. She has to get agreement from the 27 other members of the European Union before this deal can go through. Uh, what do you think will happen? I mean, how much political pressure is there on the European Union right now to agree to this? I think the European Union uh, members are pretty aligned uh, and she, it's not the most difficult part for Theresa May to get the agreement uh, of the EU and the minister met today and uh, already there is quite a, a roadmap to, to agree and be supportive of this deal. Uh, the, the main issue uh, Theresa May is facing is uh, her own party and of course the British Parliament which will have to validate the deal after uh, the EU uh, this weekend. So um, I, I think it's easy, easy uh, part for, for the deal is for the EU so far. Uh, what's difficult is that Britain gets a good deal for its citizen and for uh, the future of the economy in Britain. Garen Johns, as Alexei points out, the easy part is in Brussels, the difficult part is in London. The British Prime Minister has presented her plan. There is opposition within her party. There's been resignations in the British Cabinet. Uh, the opposition Labour Party opposes the deal, at least the leader of that party opposes the deal. Realistically, what options does Theresa May have in Britain? Well, you know, some of the leaks that came out about the nature of this deal before it was published and before Cabinet considered it in the UK were not terribly helpful. When we found what was actually in the deal, there were clearly things in there that will be helpful to Theresa May as she tries to persuade, first of all, the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, and secondly, the European Research Group, which are a, a group of hardline Brexiters within her own Conservative Party. So she has things in there that can help win them over. In the case of the DUP, the availability of an extension to the transition period as an alternative to the imposition of the backstop may help her persuade the DUP. And when it comes to the hardline Brexiters within her own party, arrangements that have been made within the deal uh, will likewise help win some of those over, as has been indicated by the fact that they've failed to get enough people to write letters to start the proceedings for a vote of no confidence in Theresa May. So the European Research Group particularly will be keen to have a mechanism whereby the UK can exit the backstop, can exit the customs union with the European Union, and uh, the deal does indeed provide that uh, through the Joint Council, failing through the Joint Council, through the arbitration mechanism. So there are things there that can help uh, in due course to uh, achieve a success in Parliament for this. If the Parliament does not approve this deal, then we're into totally uncharted territory and it's not clear what would happen. It's possible at, the, at, at that stage Mrs May would have to go. It's possible there would be a general election. It's possible there could be a people's vote where there's a second referendum essentially to find out where we go from here. Helen, there has been some speculation that uh, if this current deal is not approved that there could be a second referendum. How viable is that option? I think it's quite unlikely for a number of reasons. First of, call is, of course is that time is not on the side of those looking for another referendum. Yes, of course, it's possible that Article 50, the trigger, which means that we leave at the end of March next year, there could be some leeway. Uh, the European Union, of course, would be interested in giving us that if we were potentially to remain. But I think that there is a political angle to a second referendum that makes it very unlikely. Um, and that is, first of all, neither side could be sure of winning it. So, you know, why rerun an election? Sorry, why we run a referendum when you don't know what the outcome is going to be? Of course, the last one was fairly unpredictable, not, uh, let alone the election we had, which was also unpredictable. But equally, this is a very divisive issue for the British nation. And they voted two years ago. And if we get to a point where there is a block and an impasse. 
everyone will feel what were the politicians doing for the last two and a half years and why on earth are you coming back to us to ask us again? You know, we already told you. So um, I think that that is a, a political uh, barrier to there being uh, another referendum. Garrett, given what we just heard there, um, would it be fair to say that the biggest factor uh, that in favour of, of Theresa May is the fact that she, um, she can put this plan forward and if it's not approved, then there's no deal. Then it's a disaster, isn't it? Yes, I think that's certainly key. Um, what we've seen so far is that, I think it was mentioned by one of the fellow panellists, that there was a motion from some of the hardline Brexiteers to try and remove Theresa May, but I think the opposition is also not currently united so far as who would succeed. I think there's also a sense that Theresa May, you know, this is her deal, and so I think if you have a vote in the parliament and it collapses, then that's all it allows for other parties to then decide the next step. I don't think anybody wants to take responsibility for the deal, and so they're happy to let Theresa May do so. When you say it allows other parties to decide the next step, does that mean renegotiating the kind of divorce settlement? Not necessarily, but I think, for instance, if you look at the arithmetic, I mean, I think it seems quite clear that currently, you know, the Conservative Party doesn't really have a majority that's yeah. dependent on the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party. And it's quite clear that at least a sizable number of Conservative members of Parliament would not vote in favour of the deal. So that means that if Theresa May wanted the deal to pass, she would need support from some of the opposition. Mm -hmm. So that in itself gives already quite a lot of leverage to uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. Now it's possible that you know, Corbyn and Labour will try to get some kind of concessions, maybe the promise of a general election, mm -hmm. if they were to support a deal. But even that's not a given. So I think from Labour's perspective, they feel they are in quite a good position and that the public will probably blame Theresa May if there is a collapse and if there is no deal. Alexei, let's look at it from the EU point of view. Uh, is there still some kind of negotiating room on the part of the EU? Can they still make any kind of concessions to uh, the United Kingdom, which would make it perhaps easier for Theresa May to get this passed? I think it's going to be difficult uh, because from day one, uh, the EU has decided to be a united front and saying that there won't be a negotiation from France aside or from Germany or Netherlands uh, to help the UK. So it will be just one uh, interlocutor being uh, Michel Barnier talking about Brexit. And he's the only one who actually stayed through the old process compared to the Brexit ministers who've been resigning one after the other. So uh, there's little room actually to, to just renegotiate. What we can see is maybe some uh, space on the fisheries uh, space, which is one of the big issues uh, of this deal. And of course, uh, anything about the uh, trade between uh, uh, Calais, Club and Dover. Uh, so th th there is this, uh, but I can't see much uh, of uh, further negotiation. I think all from the EU has been put on the table. It's pretty clear. Uh, no, the EU, uh, most of the partners in the EU, if not all, want a success of uh, this, break deal, uh, this Brexit deal. They don't want a no deal option. Uh, so uh, everyone will try to help Theresa May to the best to make sure that she gets support from the parliament and from her majority, which is uh, the big uh, question mark after the negotiation. Garen Johns, of course, there are political risks for Theresa May in this. Uh, she was asked about those risks on British television. This is what she told the British network Sky News. Let's watch. You know, a change of leadership at this point isn't going to make the negotiations any easier and it's not going to change the parliamentary arithmetic. What it will do, what it will do is bring in a degree of uncertainty. That's uncertainty for people and their jobs. What it will do is mean that it is a risk that actually we delay the negotiations and that's a risk that Brexit gets delayed or frustrated. So, Garrett, Theresa May makes the point there that a change in leadership will not change anything and it doesn't change the arithmetic in Parliament. But if there is a change in leadership, could there be a new referendum? The new leader might campaign on that. If there's a change in leadership, we don't know what might happen. Uh, as I was saying earlier, we'd be in completely uncharted territory. But one thing that I think it's necessary to emphasise here is that given the red lines that the UK defined at the start of these negotiations, it's not at all clear that anybody else could have achieved a deal that is in any respect superior to the deal that Mrs May has. Uh, <clears throat> it, it may be better not to exit the European Union at all, 
uh, economically, that is almost certainly the case. But given the decision that has been taken to Brexit, it's not clear that the UK could have got a better deal than this. Now, there is a lot of negotiation still to be done. The withdrawal agreement, I think, is pretty much set in stone. But alongside that, we have the political declaration, and that is still being worked on. And a lot within that, in the current draft, is still extremely vague. And there's still likely to be a lot of bargaining to go on around that, both within the UK government and the cabinet, where there are many differing voices, and also between the UK and the European Union. Helen, do you agree with that, that the deal that's on the table right now is the best deal? Personally, or from the perspective of the country, um, look, I think it was the best under a very constrained set of circumstances. And I actually think that the, the main problem now is not necessarily the content of this deal, but how it is sold. Um, of course, there's a very technical deal. There's a lot in there that for the general public, actually for anyone, let alone the general public, is quite complex and contingent upon a various different circumstances. Um, so I think what's actually more important here is, is this Brexit? Is this what the country voted for? And uh, Geraint was just making a really good point there, which is that the, the deal, as it's being called, actually it's just the withdrawal agreement. It is just the divorce bill. It's just agreeing that we can part ways. There's a payment that's going to take place because of our liabilities that are in the EU system. Mm -hmm. And it ensures a transition period that will take us through to the end of 2020. We are supposed to then be spending the time until then focusing on this future framework that uh, Grant was just talking about. And so it, it's not really whether this is the best deal. It is really more, was this good enough to keep negotiations going? Yes, on a number of technical levels, but potentially no when it comes to selling it, because as we've already seen, people feeling strongly on both sides, both Remainers and Brexiteers have quit the cabinet, believing that this really um, locks Britain in to more future scenarios that are bad ones than the good ones that the uh, more the ideologues on either side were looking for. So I think that is absolutely more the question that we have to ask. And that's why I talk about the sales and the presentation. Right. And actually, the, what's happening this week in Brussels is key, because what, what is it? What does the future for Britain outside the EU actually look like? Garrett, uh, important points that both Helen and uh, Garrett Johns bring up there, and that is that this is just a withdrawal agreement. There's still a long way to go, isn't there? And what are the risks in that process as it unfolds? No, they're absolutely correct that they're only, you know, using, they've only dealt with the divorce, but then they would have to deal with sort of the future terms of the relationship. And that is going to be incredibly challenging in many respects, even if the current deal passes Parliament. And we've already talked about the fact that that's not going to be straightforward. Right. Let's not forget that it also has to be authorized by the European Parliament and then still has to be also authorized by at least 20 of the 27 member states. So there's a lot ahead. Even if we get to that stage and we get into the transition period, in many respects, they've kicked down the, the can down the road for some of the, the thorniest problems. And most importantly, I would say the question of the status of Northern Ireland and the future of the border. Uh, I think for the, the, the harder Brexiteers, they are very concerned that the transition, uh, as it's written currently in the political declaration, could lock up the UK for a long time in the system of the customs union, which would take away one of the big arguments that was being put forward that the UK, once free from the shackles of the European Union, could negotiate its own trade deals with the outside world. It could follow its own policies. That may not be the case. And I think that would be really devastating for those who argue that Brexit would be a real economic and trade opportunity for the UK. But isn't that a point that, uh, Garrett, many um, critics have been making, that Britain would have to play by EU rules in which it has no... Uh, role in, in, in formulating? Well, they found themselves you know, between a rock and a hard place. Uh, once they sort of agreed that they didn't want the reimposition of the hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, which I think all parties want, yeah. but to then also not be in the customs union, that didn't work. So right. there was, they had to find some sign of a problem. They're invoking, again, this idea that maybe they could have a technological answer um, to the border, but that's untested and so far hasn't really you know, we, it's not credible for the moment. 
Helen, uh, I want to get back to the domestic political situation uh, in, in the United Kingdom. The British opposition leader, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, does not like this current agreement, uh, but he's also warned of the so-called no-deal Brexit. Uh, let's listen to what he had to say. The government is trying to force through this bad deal by threatening us all with chaos and serious damage to our economy of a no-deal outcome. But I believe the Prime Minister knows that no deal isn't a real option. Neither the Cabinet nor Parliament would endorse such an extreme and, frankly, dangerous course. Labour will not countenance a no-deal Brexit. So the Labour Party, Helen, uh, they don't like what's on the table uh, and they don't like the idea of a no-deal. So what are they proposing? It's a very good question and we keep trying to get that straight answer out of the Labour Party and it's not always clear. Their strategy is that effectively if they let the government carry on with this and have the uh, tumultuous resignations from cabinet that we've seen effectively they can if they step back enough they can let this government tear itself apart and you have to say that so far their strategy is working so in a way you know it's best for them to stand back from this and and let's let's see what comes out of it let i think one of the other panelists said you know let this deal be on theresa may specifically and the conservative party to the point where it breaks down and Labour are able to say, look, we're the only people that can govern this country effectively. Look at the mess that the other side have created. But it does, uh, you know, J Jeremy Corbyn there in that clip was obviously saying it's, it's not Theresa's deal or no deal. It's Theresa's deal or actually we can come up with something better, just give us a chance, but we're not really going to tell you what it is until we get there. Um, and what's more, most concerning for me when I look at this parliamentary vote and look at how Parliament is divided, it's that for a lot of different parts of Parliament, mayhem over this deal, a real crisis, is exactly what a lot of them want to get where they want to go with this. From people who want to remain and have another vote, from those who want to leave on much more of a hard Brexit terms, but also to a Labour Party that want a shot at government. And then you can throw in interest groups like the Scottish Nationalist Party who would like the opportunity to have another independence referendum and potentially even stay in the EU, um, even as perhaps the rest of the United Kingdom leaves. So there are a lot of people who, who, who want to profit from a crisis. I do remember, I think it was uh, Barack Obama's chief of staff who said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and unfortunately and unusually, it looks like we're headed for that in the United Kingdom. Alexei, when this referendum was initially held in the United Kingdom, it was largely over the issue of immigration. Uh, immigration remains an issue. Uh, this is what the Prime Minister, Theresa May, told business leaders this week. Let's watch this. The United Kingdom is a country that values the contribution that immigration has made to our society and economy over many years. And in the future, outside the EU, immigration will continue to make a positive contribution to our national life. But the difference will be this. Once we've left the EU, we will be fully in control of who comes here. It will no longer be the case that EU nationals, regardless of the skills or experience they have to offer, can jump the queue ahead of engineers from Sydney or software developers from Delhi. Instead of a system based on where a person is from, we will have one that is built around the talents and skills a person has to offer. So, Alexei, do you think this is a big selling point for Theresa May? The fact that she can say, look, we don't, we're not going to be forced to just accept people from the European Union. We will now decide who comes to the country. Well, uh, it depends if the country is ready to actually uh, see all the demands of people wanting to come in. Uh, the good thing about uh, the European Union was the open market, the fact that a lot of Brits could come also to the continent uh, and get to work in many EU countries uh, or settled. Uh, in France, for example, we got many uh, people who are in retirement age uh, who just buy houses uh, in France or Portugal or Spain. Uh, that was also uh, a good selling point for the European Union deal uh, of immigration. Um, I think there is a, a, 
a big mistake about the figures and how many people actually are coming to the UK or leaving. Uh, and, and it was, uh, back in the days, uh, quite useful for the UK to have all these people from Poland, from France, from Italy, uh, coming to work in London, in the, in the hospital, from the NHS, uh, or anywhere else. So I don't think it's a clear uh, good selling point because we don't know how uh, the uh, paperwork will be treated, how actually the selection will be done of these people wanting to come in the UK. If it's so difficult, in the end, uh, will people want to come in? Uh, that's, uh, that's the key question. Uh, I, I don't know what's, what's the win-win uh, situation there if the Brits uh, then are stuck in the, in the UK within the island and get it very difficult uh, to move around freely uh, in the EU continent. All right, Gareth Johns, uh, there is a summit of EU leaders that's uh, scheduled for Sunday. Uh, that's where the leaders will discuss this political declaration. Uh, do you think that meeting is going to take place? I'm sure it will take place. Uh, the cabinet in the UK has approved the deal. Uh, the only hurdle that remains in the UK now is to get that through Parliament. Uh, that's a big hurdle. Uh, but it does seem as though the challenges to this meeting in, on Sunday uh, have uh, faded away somewhat because the vote of no confidence in Theresa May doesn't look as though that's going to be triggered. Uh, Garrett, what about Britain's other options? It leaves the European Union. Uh, what are its trade options? Forging deals with other countries around the world. It has said it wants to do that. Perhaps a free trade pact with the United States. Yes, I think that's contingent on the fact that the UK would be outside of the, you know, of the customs union. As long as then the customs union, they are, as I mentioned, not, not allowed or entitled to be able to make free trade deals with the United States. In addition, also, let's keep in mind that, yes, there was a lot of an argument being made by the Leave campaign that this would be a great opportunity for the United Kingdom. But you'll have to see, will the UK be quite as appealing as a market now that it's on its own and not as an entry point to the single market? I think that leads to the point about immigration that you asked Alexis. Uh, yes, now you can say we welcome engineers from Delhi or Sydney, yeah. but will they want to come? Will the United Kingdom be such an appealing place you know, if you are a highly qualified engineer, there are probably a lot of other places that you might be welcome. So that's something to keep in mind. I understand that the point made by Theresa May, but in practice, especially if uh, the cost of Brexit on the UK's economy are stark, yeah. that will have an impact on whether it's desirability for highly skilled migrants. Uh, Garen Johns, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, um, in, in terms of the uh, creation of new trade deals, the most important one for the UK to generate will be the trade deal with the European Union. And we have some pointers as to what that might look like in the political declaration. Uh, one of the things that's key in that is saying that we will have close customs partnership and we will have close regulatory uh, alignment with the European Union. And that may make it difficult for the UK to strike out on its own and generate new independent trade deals with other countries. The other thing that we need to recognize is that modern trade deals are very complex and one of the things that comes into these trade deals concerns the mobility of labor. So while Theresa May is saying now that there will no longer be freedom of mobility of labor once the UK has left the European Union, we don't yet know what the new free trade ar arrangement will be with the EU and what that will imply for migration. Helen, I've got a little bit of time left, about 30 seconds. What are your thoughts on the uh, United Kingdom uh, getting independent deals outside of the European Union? Well, it, it is going to depend quite a bit, as we said, on this future political framework. As it stands at the moment, it looks like it's going to be quite tricky because although staying in the customs union is only a backstop option, how can you start doing free trade deals when that is lurking in the background? So I think uh, it is a difficult position for the United Kingdom to be in when it comes to free trade deals. OK, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. <laughs>